This is the Macintosh 128K. This Macintosh only has 128 kilobytes of RAM and no internal storage. To put that in perspective, 128 kilobytes of RAM is only 0.00128 of a gigabyte. To put this even further into perspective, there is 6 gigabytes of RAM in the newest iPhone 13 Pro. You're probably wondering, how with such little RAM and zero storage on a computer, how are you even supposed to download anything to this computer? Well, we'll get to that in just a second. First, let me explain the background behind this computer and why I went out of my way to film an entire video about it. But to do that, I need to go even further back in time, back before Apple was even a company. It wasn't until the early 1940s that computers started to be taken seriously. However, computers were not meant for the general populace. They were designed for industrial use only and were extremely limited in their abilities. Computers were also huge and took up entire rooms. It took a large team of technicians to run them and very few end users saw any value in these big clunky computers. But all of that was about to change. On April 11th, 1976, Stephen Wozniak, or Woz as he was called, designed the first computer for the company that would later be known as Apple. The computer would become famously known as the Apple One, and at Woz's side was Steve Jobs, the marketing genius who would drive Apple to become one of the most influential tech companies in the world. This is the Apple One. It was pretty bare bones and did not come with a display or a keyboard to run it. This computer came out in 1976. To the eyes of an end user, it was no more than a computer for hobbyists. Steve and Woz started by assembling 50 of these Apple One computers and sold them to a tech store in Mountain View, California called The Byte Shop. The Byte Shop would become the first retailer to ever sell Apple computers. Apple would later end up making about 200 of these Apple One computer boards. And a year later, in 1977, the Apple II was born. It was the first ready-to-use computer to hit the market. It was the first computer made for end users. It had a built-in keyboard and an outer shell that gave it a sleek and futuristic look that everybody loved. All you had to do was plug it into a screen and you were good to go. This computer sold in the millions for nearly two decades. But now, Apple is looking to reach an even larger spectrum of people. All computers, including the Apple II, had a problem. The only way to control a computer was through keyboard commands. This meant that to do anything you either had to memorize keyboard commands or have a book sitting next to your computer that you would have to rely on constantly for instruction. This issue alone drove many people to have no interest in computers. Apple needed to make a computer that had a user interface that could be altered without keyboard commands, but also required very little setup. In 1983, Apple released the Lisa computer. It was the first computer that used a user interface controlled by a mouse. This invention by Apple would change the way people would use computers forever. In fact, it would inspire other companies like Microsoft to implement mouses into their future computers as well. But there was another problem with this computer. It was overpriced and underpowered. The Apple Lisa would be replaced by a computer that changes the computing industry forever. The Apple Lisa was set the groundwork for the Macintosh 128K, which many people believe is the most important milestone in the computing industry today. A year later, in 1984, the Macintosh 128K was born. This was one of Steve Jobs' most influential moments. The Macintosh 128K was small, it took up very little room on a desk, and it came with lots of new software that would greatly benefit it like MacWrite and MacPaint. This computer was truly a home computer. I am lucky enough to have acquired my own Macintosh 128K from my grandfather. So today, I will be setting it up for you guys and showing you what it was like to use a Macintosh in 1984. Like I said earlier in the video, the Macintosh 128K is extremely easy to set up. First, you plug in the power cable. The next step is plugging in the mouse. The mouse plugs into the back of the Macintosh using a VGA cable. The next step is plugging in the keyboard. The keyboard is plugged in with this cable right here in the front of the Macintosh. Next, the keyboard is plugged in with this small port on the back of the keyboard. And once that's plugged in, you have successfully set up the entire Macintosh, and it is ready to be powered on. But first, let's look at some of the documentation that comes with the Macintosh 128K. 
1984, many people still did not know how to use a computer. So Apple shipped out the Macintosh with extremely detailed manuals on how to use a computer. Inside the manual, there are lots of pictures and text describing what this thing is capable of. And I've read a couple of the pages of this manual and Apple was able to make this computer so user friendly that even a child could use it. And I don't know about you guys, but I think this instruction manual is very visually pleasing. One of my favorite parts of this instruction manual is the page that teaches you how to use a mouse because in our day and age, using a mouse is second nature. Overall, I think Apple did a fantastic job making this a user friendly computer. Next in the box, we have the instruction manual for MacWrite. MacWrite was the first word processor to be taken large scale successfully. It was very rudimentary in its abilities. However, complexity was not something Apple wanted, so it ended up working out for them. Like the Macintosh manual, the manual is very easy to understand. It shows you how to change fonts, format your margins, change your spacing, and all that other good stuff. Once you were done typing your document, all you had to do is hit print and you were good to go. The software was the start of the word processor, and it is really, really cool. Next in the box, we have Mac Paint. Mac Paint was the first graphical art program ever. It was in black and white, of course, since the Macintosh 128K was in black and white, but it still had a lot of really cool features. You could paint, you could draw, make shapes, and much more. It took full advantage of the mouse and gave people the freedom to let their imagination run wild. Mac Paint set the groundwork for graphical art programs that we use today. In fact, Apple tried to sue Microsoft for copying Mac Paint software and using it on their computers a couple months after it released. Unfortunately, Apple lost this lawsuit. Next, we have a guided tour of Macintosh, MacWrite, and Mac Paint. This tape would give basic instruction on how to use the software that was described in the manuals. This was another way Apple tried to make the Macintosh a more user-friendly computer. Personally, I would definitely use the tape because I hate reading instruction manuals, and I just hate reading in general. Unfortunately, I do not own a tape player, so I have not been able to listen to this tape. But it is still a fantastic idea from Apple, and I hopefully will be able to listen to this tape soon. Now, like I said in the beginning of the video, this computer only has 128 kilobytes of RAM and does not have any internal storage. That is where these disks, which are popularly known as floppy disks, come into play. They stored entire software programs that allowed any type of program that you would be running on the Macintosh to work. Once inserted into the Macintosh, the floppy disk would then upload small data packets from the disk onto the 128 kilobyte RAM on the Macintosh, allowing the computer to display information from the disk. This meant that in order to even use a basic program, the Macintosh would have to constantly be uploading and offloading data from its RAM in order to not run out of space on the RAM. Most floppy disks came with the system file, but if they didn't, you'd first have to insert the system disk. And then you would have to eject the system disk and insert your desired software. Sometimes you'd have to switch between the system disk and your software disk multiple times just to get one single program to load, which actually took a really long time. Once the system disk is installed, it is time to turn on the Macintosh. It is actually very surprising how fast the Macintosh 128K starts up for being made 38 years ago. Once the Macintosh starts up, it is now ready to run any program that is compatible with this Macintosh. For the rest of the video, I will let you guys enjoy the startup process of this Macintosh. Thank each and every one of you for watching my videos, and I hope that you will like and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any future content. Don't hesitate to ask any questions about the Macintosh 128K in the comments. Let me know if any of you guys want to see a video where I show you guys MacWrite and MacPaint on the Macintosh. Thanks everyone.